The pastor was in the middle of his sermon and noticed a man had fallen asleep with his head on his wife's shoulder. So he said, wake up your husband. And the wife smiled and replied, you put him to sleep, you wake him up. <laughs> think, about, think about this during a sermon and otherwise. Um, how much of you is God allowed to have? Think about that. How much of you do you allow God to have? Matthew 20, Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. This sermon today is about the time when Ahab was the king of Israel. He became the king of Israel during the reign of Asa, king of Judea. There were two different kingdoms at this point. The, the, the kingdom of Israel split into two factions after the death of Solomon. So Israel is called the northern ten kingdoms that broke away from Judea and Jerusalem. And that is in, in this context called Israel. So there was a northern kingdom and this, at this particular time Ahab was the king of Israel and that was during the reign of Asa, king of Judea. And uh, so Israel is not Judea. That causes some confusion, but Israel and Judea are not the same, but they are both Hebrew um, originally. Jezebel was the notorious wife of Ahab. Her father was the king of Sidon, so she was a Sidonian princess. So at this time, here's what was happening in Judea, 1 Kings 15, 11 to 14. Asa did what was right. Asa is the king now of Judea. Did what was right in the eyes of the Lord as his father David had done. He wasn't directly the son of David. When they say that, they mean he was a descendant of David. He expelled the male shrine prostitutes from the land and got rid of all the idols his ancestors had made. He even deposed his grandmother, Maica from her position as queen mother because she had made a repulsive image for the worship of Asherah. Asa cut it down and burned it in the Kidron Valley. Verse 14, although he did not remove the high places, Asa's heart was fully committed to the Lord all of his life. Now that was in Judea, which is, the, which is what was left. Two of the kingdoms, two of the tribes that was left around Jerusalem there when the northern ten tribes, tribes departed. And so this is what was happening at that particular time in Israel, which is the northern ten tribes. First Kings 16.29 in the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, son of Omri, became king of Israel. And he reigned in Samaria over Israel for 22 years. 1 Kings 16, 30 to 33, Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He not only considered it trivial, to commit the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Jeroboam was the one who led the northern ten tribes away, and uh, he made golden calves and set them up in two places and declared them to be the gods of Israel. But he, in continuing in the verse, Ahab, that is, also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbal, king of Sidon, the Sidonians had began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he had built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole and did more to arouse the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, 
than did all of the kings of Israel before him. But you have to remember that he was Hebrew. The northern kingdoms were Hebrew as much as the southern kingdoms were. But that's the background of this event. Uh, Jezebel had imported 400 prophets of Asherah and 450 prophets of Baal. They were said to eat at her table. In other words, she supported them. Jezebel was a foreigner in Israel, and so were the prophets that she supported. All of them were evil. Jezebel was also trying to destroy the prophets of God. The Bible said that she was killing them off. Asherah worship was a deeply sensual, involving illicit sex and ritual prostitution. In other words, their worship was perverted, and they did it openly. This was culturally sanctioned perversion. It was closely associated with the worship of Baal. Asherah was thought to be Baal's mother. The Israelites did evil in the, uh, in the Lord's sight. They forgot about the Lord their God, and they served the images of Baal and Asherah and the Asherah poles. That's from Judges 3 and 7. At times, to appease Baal and Asherah, human sacrifices were made. These sacrifices usually consisted of the firstborn child of the person making the sacrifice. Picture that now. The firstborn child being burned alive as a sacrifice to Baal. Jeremiah 19.5, they have built high places to, of Baal and burned their children in the fire as offerings to Baal, something I did not command or mention, nor did it enter my mind. They burned their children as a sacrifice to Baal. They burned them alive, their own children. I can't even wrap my head around that. In Joshua 24, 14 to 20, now the fear of the Lord, now fear the Lord and serve him. With all faithfulness, throw away the gods your ancestors worshiped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our parents up out of Egypt from that land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us in our, in, on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. And Joshua said to the people, you're not able to serve the Lord. He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he has been good to you. So that happened in the book of Joshua after the people crossed into the promised land and they said, we will serve the Lord. And here you have the northern ten tribes already not serving. This was a, probably a couple hundred years later. So then God sent Elisha. Uh, this was actually Elijah, not Elisha. First Kings chapter 18, 19 to 21. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Car Mount Carmel. Elijah is giving this order to King Ahab. 
the prophet Elijah, who had the anointing power of God resting on him, summoned Ahab and he gave him these orders. Summon the people from all over Israel. In other words, Israel is the northern ten kingdoms, the northern ten tribes, to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. He obeyed, Ahab obeyed Elijah and did what he said. Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. And this is the key to this sermon, but the people said nothing. They said nothing. No comment, no answer, nothing to say. These people knew who the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was. They knew who, about that. They knew who Moses was. They would have known about the Ten Commandments. The first of which was, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or in the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. They knew all this, but they were putting up with and, and and doing the worship of Baal and Asherah, which was all evil and foul. So the people said nothing because they knew that what they were doing was wrong. They knew that they were wrong. They knew they shouldn't be worshiping foreign gods. They were wavering between two opinions there was something exciting and different about these foreign gods. The sensuality of their worship was intoxicating. These people didn't have anything to say because they knew that they were wrong. If they didn't do it themselves, then they condoned evil practices with their silence. Ahab's heart wasn't a heart after God. He was weak-willed. He allowed his wife to massacre some of the prophets of God. She was a murderer. She murdered Naboth so Ahab could have his vineyard. He was double-minded. James 4, 8, come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. I'm probably preaching to the choir today. <laughs> but there are people that watch this online. He was worldly minded. James 4, for you adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. And I would say to you that the climate cultists are worshiping the world and they are the enemies of God I would say that to you he was self-centered he participated in like I said the Jezebel's murder of Naboth so he could have Naboth's vineyard during the drought he was more concerned about his animals than he was about the people maybe he deserved a wife like Jezebel so Elijah ordered King Ahab to summon all the people and to bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah, and Ahab did it. He was the king. 
But he obeyed Elijah. He knew Elijah had the power of God on him. Getting back to the people who had no answer, they knew what right and wrong was. They knew the difference between right and wrong. They had the truth. They had the prophets. They had the Ten Commandments. But they were into idolatry. They were worshiping Baal and Asherah, and that worship was evil. Some people like evil. Some like to see what they can get away with. And others just look the other way. Look at Nazi Germany. People put up with a radical rebel rouser and 60 million people died in World War II. These people knew better. They knew right from wrong. They had let it happen. They just let it happen. Look at slavery in this country. <clears throat> the slave owners and those who agreed with them must have known right from wrong. They were church attendees. What they were doing was evil. The way blacks were treated in this country, in the South, even after slavery, was evil. And look what's happening in our own society. Criminals go free. Soros-backed prosecutors refuse to incarcerate criminals. Smash and grabbers go free. People steal from stores with impunity. One guy defended himself in a store and killed the robber, and they went after him, put him in jail. If decent people try to stop them, they get arrested. If you try to stop evildoers, you're an evildoer, according to these crazy prosecutors. So what kind of philosophy says that you have a right to steal? What kind of philosophy says a store owner doesn't have a right to use force to protect his property? But try that in one of the big cities in this country. Our borders are being overrun. The current administration isn't doing anything to stop it. So where is the clamor? Where is the outrage from conservative patriots? Where is the outrage from Christian believers? Same-sex marriages. When this happened during Obama's rule, there was outrage. Where was the outrage? Where was it from Christians? Where was the marches in the streets against that? Where were the marches in front of Supreme Court justices' houses like you had when the court overturned Roe v. Wade? They threatened the justices marching around in front of their houses. So where are the marches for God? The people said nothing. The rainbow people have taken over the Methodist Church, the United Methodist Church. Other denominations that once promoted the truth are now marrying same-sexers, ordaining gay ministers, and accepting the behaviors of the alphabet people. In the church. The church is supposed to promote godly Christian behaviors and morality. We know what pleases God and what doesn't. Entire denominations are on the wrong side of God. And the people said nothing. Said nothing. Some of them just left. We had three visitors here that were United Methodist ministers who left, they, can't, they couldn't stand that, they, they left. Good for them. Where's the rest of them? At one time the Methodist Church was the main promoter of salvation in this country and in England. The latest and, more, and one of the most ridiculous is the this gender bender business 
the proponents have the nerve to call it gender care. <laughs> Tell me how mutilating children is care. They want to treat children with puberty blockers without the parents' knowledge or consent. I'm just simple enough to declare to you that there are only two genders. Where are the people? The people said nothing. This whole trend to change the gender of children is based on feelings. If you feel like you're a boy but you're a girl, well then we're going to have to give you puberty blockers and turn you in to a boy. There's no clinical test for this, what they call dysphoria. There's no clinical test. It's based on feelings and what they need. According to, uh, I was reading the report by a doctor, what they need is therapy. These are dangerous drugs. They have terrible side effects and it's not reversible. Genesis 127, so God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God, he created them male and female, he created them. A man in Australia went to jail for calling his daughter she. And the people said nothing. Our whole society is on the wrong side of God. I wonder if Jesus himself appeared. What would the people say to him? They didn't have any words for Elijah. So what would they say to Jesus? Would they just shrug their shoulders and not say anything? Let's go back to Elijah and see what happened. This, by the way, is part one of a two-part series. I'm not sure I'll preach the next part next week, but uh, this is part one. So remember that the people in 1 Kings 18, 21 had no answer. Just like so many who call themselves believers today have no answer. So Elijah proposed this, 1 Kings 18, 22 to 24. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left. But if Baal has 450 prophets, get two bulls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for them, themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull, put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord, the God who answers by fire, he is God. Then all the people say, said, what you say is good. The people who had nothing to say are now saying that's a good idea. Oh, a test. We'll see. The people didn't have faith. If you want to see, you don't have faith. They like the idea of a proof. If something's proven to you, that means you didn't, didn't have a heart to believe it. You just wanted to wait and see. As Christians like that today, let's wait and see. 1 Kings 18 this is a bit of a long verse, but I'm going to read it. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one of the bulls and prepare it first, since there are so many of you. Call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull given them and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning until noon. Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar that they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is a god. Perhaps he's in deep thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he is sleeping and must be awakened. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom until the blood, their blood flowed. Midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. 
No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come here to me. All the people was the same all the people that had no answer. They were the same all the people who, who thought it was a good idea to just have this test. Come here to me. So they came to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. No doubt, no doubt Jezebel was behind the tearing down of that altar. Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes that descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. With the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord and dug a trench around it large enough to hold two sayas of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said, and he did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it a third time. The water ran down <clears throat> around the altar and even filled the trench. <coughs> At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, and Lord, answer me so these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, this is the same, all the people who could didn't have an answer, they fell prostrate and cried, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. Then Elijah commanded them, seize the prophets of Baal, don't let anyone get away. They seized them, and Elijah had them brought down to the Kishon Valley and slaughtered there. I think these people wanted to believe in the one true God. But as Elijah said, they were wavering between two opinions. In other words, they were double-minded. There must have been enough, all the people to capture, to seize 450 prophets of Baal. Must have been a thousand of them. What happened to the 400 prophets of Asherah, we're not told and we don't know. That's a good question. I don't know. I don't know what happened to them. But they were summoned to come there too. Maybe they got away, maybe they ran away, maybe they changed their heart. I don't know, maybe they went back to Sidon. I don't know. All of the ills that plague this country are a result of a nation departing from God. This is happening in the whole world. God's will used to be important in the public conscience ministers and people of faith used to be respected not so anymore I could see this change take place in my own lifetime now we're ridiculed because we take a stand we're on God's side and we know it the people are divided between going their own way and following God well-meaning people come up with their own notions about what is right and what's wrong you hear people say, well, tell them our thoughts and prayers are with them, but these people aren't God people. Their thoughts and prayers, our thoughts and prayers are with you, but they're not. People are all around us, our neighbors, our coworkers, they're in our family, some people come into church, most do not. There are people who go to church occasionally thinking that God is pleased with them just because they showed up at church and put a dollar in the offering. But they live on their own morality the rest of the time. 
So what are they going to say to Jesus? What, what's going to be their answer? They don't have an answer. Here's what they need to do. In Joel 2, 12 and 13, Even now declares the Lord, Return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Rend your heart. You know what rend means? Tear. It means tear. Tear your heart. Look so deeply into your own life that it's heart rending if what you find in there that may not be in accordance with God's will. God's not satisfied with only part of your life. I started with this question. He wants it all. He wants your thought life. He wants you to have a prayer life. He wants you to have a scripture life. He wants all of it. He wants you to love him, be devoted to him. He wants all of it. Amen? All of it. Would you stand? I'm going to invite you to come and find a place to pray. You can kneel, stand, sit, whatever you're comfortable with, but just come.